Hubble, uh, not the telescope. I'm going to be talking about the man. It was a talk I was going to do uh, towards the end of March, but we got stymied by the uh, the virus pandemic. And uh, basically, when we first started with these webinars, we weren't quite sure of how long we would be allowed on because I don't think we had a license for a couple of weeks. So uh, you're now getting what we sh you should have had a couple of months ago. It was part of a series uh, we were going to do, me and Paul were doing with um, data gathering of galaxies because we were going to do a thing on um, imaging galaxies. So anyway, to, to cut to the chase, this is a talk about uh, this guy, Edwin Powell Hubble, there he is, uh, with his pipe, born in 1889 in Missouri, uh, died 1953 in California. And it's probably, for most people, A, is connected to the telescope, but B, remembered in terms of the expanding universe, ref shifts and, and all that. I'm actually going to be talking about the man himself. I'm going to be, bring a little of the science in, but uh, it's really going to be his life story. Typical of any Americans, and actually anybody else, uh, they have a long history. And there's actually a Hubble society uh, of which uh, Edwin Powell Hubble was a member of the Hubble clan family. Uh, they have a, uh, a logo uh, of a, a ship where uh, Richard Hubble arrived at the, the America in but they also got a space uh, the space telescope as part of their logo to identify that uh, Edwin Hubble was part of the Hubble family. The spelling of the name changes. There are Hubbles with an A, Hubbles as spelt uh, Edwin's way, and Hubble with the E double L version. They're based in uh, Connecticut uh, because that's where Richard Hubble came from. And uh, Richard Hubble started off in Worcestershire. He emigrated to America round about 1646. Uh, that is in the middle of the English Civil War, uh, the part of the Civil War called the Interbellum. Uh, Naseby was 1645 that sort of ended part one of the Civil War and then part two which led to Charlie Boy having his head cut off started about 1648. Ribbersford was only about 50 miles from Naseby so there's a good chance that this Richard Hubble took part in Naseby and was probably on the parliamentarian side because of his religion. Uh, but he, went, he popped over to America at the age of uh, about 20, uh, married three times, had lots of kids, and he was the start of the Hubble clan in America. Uh, they've got his grave set up that's his original gravestone and they've obviously put a new stone uh, to commemorate him and he's founder of the Hubble family so that's a bit of the very early background to Hubble but this is his Edwin Powell Hubble's immediate family tree uh, Joseph Powell is where he gets the Powell name from uh, and that's his great-grandfather he was in the military and was actually cashiered he was brought to trial uh, by a military commission uh, for disobeying orders. Uh, it was something to do with the Indian Wars, clearing the Indians out uh, from Florida. Uh, but he apparently disobeyed orders and uh, was cashiered out of the army. Uh, William James was a doctor uh, and is Edwin's uh, grandfather. He's important in the story in the sense that he was actually the doctor who birthed Hubble. He also played a part in Hubble's becoming interested in astronomy. The male line of Hubble's, Martin Jones, the grandfather, John Powell Hubble, the father, were all lawyers or had trained in the law uh, and actually be then became insurance agents. Martin Jones Hubble was the state superintendent for the Home Insurance Company of New York. He was also clerk to the court in Springfield, Missouri. Uh, John Powell, again qualified as a lawyer, and he was uh, then become an insurance agent, uh, as did 
Levi Jones and Joel William uh, Hubble. Uh, so all the family was sort of tied up with the law and insurance, apart from Marshall. And he became a cook on a ranch. So he, he escaped. And it was all set up for Edwin to become a lawyer stroke insurance man as his career, future career. In 1995, John took the family, John Hubble took the family to St. Louis, uh, moved with his job, and one night they went out to the Yeatman Observatory at Washington University. And it was there that the six-year-old Edwin Hubble first looked through a telescope, and that hooked him for life. Uh, the Yeatman Telescope still in use today. Uh, it was built in 1857. It's now housed in a more modern dome and the students of the university actually use it as part of their astronomical society activities. Two years later, eighth birthday, 1897, Grandfather James, the doctor who helped uh, Edwin come into the world, wants to know what to, to get Edwin for a present. Now, there's an awful lot of stuff in the Hubble Museum, so this is where a lot of all this documentation I found comes from, if you're wondering. And uh, we had a friend called Oliver Wells, a dealer in books, and he found a book called Popular Telescopic Astronomy, How to Make a Two-Inch Telescope, uh, by A. Fowler, F-R-A-S, and he got the book and he made a telescope for young Edwin. There's Alfred Fowler who wrote the book. You can get the book on Gutenberg Press. It's a freebie uh, PDF uh, format. Uh, so if you're interested in having a look at it, it's there online. So Alfred Fowler, born in Bradford, uh, wrote a lot of books. He was a communicator of the time on astronomy. About the same time, Edwin's in school. So there he is. Uh, at the Marshfield Public School, the, that's the 1897-1898 school picture. Uh, and then 1900, the Powell family moved to Chicago. Uh, Edwin's father is working for the New York Life Insurance Building in Chicago. That is an actual picture of the building at the time from 1900. Uh, it's a grand looking place. I think at the time it was, one, it was the tallest or one of the tallest buildings in Chicago. Uh, we can check the address. This is Evanstown in Chicago. Here we've got Hubble John. Uh, Edwin's uncle Joel is there. Again insurance adjuster. So they're both working insurance. And they're living at 1310 Judson Avenue. And the beauty with modern computers is you can go on Google Maps and uh, there's 1310 Justin Avenue Chicago today. I suspect that house is a later house. Uh, I, I suspect that the house from 1910 has, has gone and that, that probably is a sort of a 1950s or even 1960s house. Uh, but uh, it's nice to search these things out. At the age of 14, Edwin had surgery for appendicitis and was off school for a while. And uh, he got his hands on a load of astronomy books and he, he spent three months studying and writing about astronomy. And there's some notebooks um, where he, he made his thoughts down and actually some observations with his telescope. But 1906, he, he begins his studies at the University of Chicago at a young age. He was only, he was under 17, he was eight, late 16, and he was studying mathematics, astronomy, and philosophy. So there's the University of Chicago in 1907, quite a nice looking campus. And he was also very sporty. So there's the University of Chicago track team with Edwin in it and the Chicago basketball team of 1909, which actually won the national championships, national basketball championships. Uh, so he was no mean athlete. Uh, 
I always find it amazing. I mean, 1909, he's 20 years old. These guys are all going to be around about the same age. They look in the 40s. I mean, didn't anybody look young in 1909? They had really tough paper rounds. Yes, they must have done. They, they, they look old before the time, but, you know, there you go. Uh, he, he actually won a scholarship to go to Chicago, uh, which helped the fees. And uh, that ball that we see here that won the championship, uh, astronaut John Grunsfeld, on 2009 mission to actually repair the Hubble Space Telescope, took the ball up in the shuttle with him and then returned it to the, 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 the museum in Chicago University. So that basketball uh, from 1909 went all the way up and met the namesake's telescope. He graduated with his bachelor's degree in 1910 and he attended a three-day meeting of the uh, Astronomical Society of America. And uh, you've probably seen this photograph before when I did my talk about Pickering and uh, the ladies of Harvard. And uh, this was at Harvard. There's Pickering, there's Wilhelmina Fleming, uh, Enretta, um, who did the series. Uh, and can we find Edwin in there? is there hiding at the back also at that meeting was alfred fowler who'd written the book that gave him his first telescope and he made friends and they exchanged letters for a few years later his father was going to have his way so he got a scholarship a Rhodes scholarship to oxford university in england to study law queen's college oxford Still a sporty type of chap. Uh, he, he was in the Oxford University baseball team. Uh, and that is him pitching. And this apparently is Edwin Huppel doing the high jump. The athletics team. So he gets his degree in law. Uh, he's, he's awarded his degree literally days before his father dies. He returns back to America. Uh, he came actually on this ship, the SS Dominion. I found a picture of it. Uh, and uh, he retired back in the USA on the 4th of June, 19, 1913. He doesn't want to be a lawyer. He wants to be an astronomer. And he has to sort things out. So he, he ends up... for. A, it has a gap year. He teaches high school physics, mathematics and Spanish, coaches the basketball team at the New Albany High School in Indiana. He's got a friend there and he stops with his friend, uh, John Roberts, takes a photograph of him uh, looking through a telescope. Uh, but one of the notable things about Edwin at this time now is that he spent some years in England. He's developed an English accent. He's also taken to dressing in tweedy jackets and smoking a pipe. He's become British, or what he thinks British is, middle class British. 1914, he returned to the University of Chicago to begin studying for a PhD in astronomy. Uh, and his dissertation is uh, the investigation of faint nebula, which we know today, a lot, some of those are now galaxies. And he learns how to use photography at the back end of a telescope. There's the Yerkes Observatory. Uh, it's in Williams Bay, Wisconsin. It's now shut. It was closed in 2000, October 2018 and it's currently the subject of a legal wrangle because uh, Yerkes, uh, Charles Yerkes, who donated the land and the money to build it, um, he was a, a fairly rich man. He'd actually been involved in actually uh, building a lot of the London Underground and that's where he'd made a lot of his money. Uh, but 
it's the the deal was that if uh, University of Chicago stopped using Yerkes, that it would revert back to the family. And this is sort of, we're now talking over 100 years later, and there is legal wrangles going on about uh, getting it back. Uh, Chicago, I think, want to turn it into housing. So it's a shame because that's a grand looking building. So, 1914 to 1916, he takes a large number of photographs. He finds over a thousand uncatalogued nebula. And at that time, the system of classification was done by a chap called Max Wolf, had done a classification of nebula. Looking with our eyes today, we can see that there are galax galaxies, spiral galaxies. There's also what appear to be planetary nebulas in there. Uh, various types. <coughs> so all the gaseous stuff is lumped together as fuzzy objects, as me and Paul call them, because we like planets, me and Paul. So he's, he's working for his uh, PhD, and as he's doing this, there's a new telescope being built at Mount Wilson in California. George Ellery Hale, uh, he's the director of it and uh, it's going to have a new 100 inch telescope which will, at the time would be the largest in the world and everything is carted up to the top on horseback by what they're called mule skinners and I'm going to come back to mule skinners in a little while because they play an important part in my story but he's offered a job after he qualifies with his degree at Mount Wilson. But unfortunately on April 1917, America declares war on Germany. And ever the Patriot, Mr. Hubble, Edwin wants to join up. So he manages to persuade the, the powers to be at uh, Chicago University that he needs to do his uh, viva examination, his oral examination early, so he can get his PhD and then go off and uh, fight the Bosch. Uh, this date is brought forward, it's duly granted, and he's 27 years old, and he completes his thesis. It's very, very short, it's only 17 pages long, it has 15 tables, two figures and four plates, which compared to what you get as PhD submissions today is minute. But he got his PhD, he got his doctorate. Uh, there's the publication uh, by Edwin Obill. Uh, it, uh, it says that little is known of the nature of nebula and no significant classification has been suggested. Not even a precise definition has been formulated. The essential features are that they are situated outside our solar system and they should be unresolved into separate stars. Some, at least the great diffuse nebulosities connected as they are with even naked eye stars, lie within our solar system, while others, the great spirals, with their enormous radial velocities and insensible proper motions, apparently lie outside our system. The planetary is gaseous but well defined, or probably within our sidereal system, but at vast distances from the Earth. A lot of the thought at the time was that actually these nebula, the spirals and others, were actually within the Milky Way. The Milky Way was the universe, so everything should be contained within the Milky Way. And Edwin Hubble is starting to go with the view that the large spirals are outside the Milky Way. Um, if we look further, you can actually buy his uh, thesis today on Amazon. It's uh, leather bound, £32.15. Uh, I'm sure you'd enjoy it. But more importantly, what was Hubble's conclusions? The spirals form a continuous series from the Great Nebula of Andromeda to the limit of resolution the 901 smaller ones being much more numerous. Considering them to lie scattered at random as regards distance and size, 
some conception may be formed of their dimensions from the data in hand. At the lower limit of average distance, the spirals of the typical nebula would be 15 light years in diameter, 45 million times as massive as our sun, and three times 10 to the 13 as dense as our atmosphere. On the other hand, if these spiral nebulas are placed at a suitable distance, millions of light years, its dimensions assume the same order of magnitude as those of our stellar system. Straight away, Hubble has got to the point that these spirals are galaxies just like the Milky Way and the Ulmer right. He's, he's looked at the, the orbital speed of the proper motion and the radial motion through spectroscopy of the galaxies and come up with these conclusions on terms of their mass and velocities. So he's got his degree, he's got his doctorate and he signs up. Uh, he registers, he does some army training at Fort Sheridan in Illinois. Uh, he's given the rank of Major in the Infantry, the 343rd Infantry, 86th Division. And probably fortunately for Hubble, he arrives in France in October 1918. And um, basically he has three weeks at the front before the guns full silence. So he doesn't actually see a lot of combat. Uh, he's about 27 now and as I say I mean I'm, I'm surprised how old he looks in that picture. I mean again he, look, he looks a man of 40 but he's only 27 but uh, that's me. So the American army set, sent him back to England to look after American students and American army students who are studying in England. Uh, basically looking after the finances and making sure they've got accommodation and uh, a bit of a bursa, bursa's job. Uh, but while he's in there, he, he pals up with Hugh Frank Newell, Professor of Astrophysics at Cambridge. And they, they have dinners together. Uh, they do some observing. Uh, he's allowed to use the uh, observatory at Cambridge and the telescopes and you will submit Edwin to membership of the Royal Astronomical Society and is accepted as a member uh, May the 9th 1919. The end of summer 1919 he returns to the United States and he takes up Hilary Ailes offer of a post at Mount Wilson and he starts his post there on September the 3rd. Uh, he's using the 16, 60 inch reflector to take his photographs and the guy that is basically the technician running the observatory, the night assistant, is introduced to him, a guy called Humerson and he plays a big part in, in the story of the redshift and discoveries. At that time it's still thought that a lot of these, the galaxies, the, the gaseous spirals are still part of the Milky Way. And Harlow Shapley, who is director at Harvard, actually he is strongly in favour of the spirals being part of the Milky Way. Uh, he opposes the view that the spirals are outside the Milky Way. And he done some work on looking at distances to globular clusters using things called CFIDs, CFID variables. And this is what Hubble is going to use, CFID variables, to look at the distance of the, the spiral galaxies, the spiral nebula. Now, a bit of explanation of what a CFID is. It's a variable star. It's like clockwork. It has a regular period. It ticks. You can predict exactly when it's going to get to its maximum predict exactly when it's going to get to a minimum and the period doesn't change. Henrietta Lewitt Levitt had discovered these back in about 1909 and what they found was that more intrinsically bright CFIDs oscillate at a slow rate. Their variability period is longer. Whereas if it's got it's not as bright, it's not as luminous, its variability is shorter, it flashes quicker. 
And you can plot that on a chart, absolute magnitude against period. That means that if you can measure the period, you can work out what the absolute magnitude is, you can see how bright it is, you can measure the distance. I've mentioned Hugh Mason, the night assistant. Now, he'd started life, Matt Wilson has a mule skinner or a pack horse trainer. There he is, uh, leading his horse and the stuff up the mountain to help build the observatory. When the observatory was built, he took the job as janitor, uh, cleaning out the toilets, I suppose, and sweeping the floor. But he grew, got an interest in photography and he had great skill in obtaining detailed photographs. So in a very, very short time, he was employed by Hale as the assistant to run the telescopes, the photographic work in the telescope which is amazing to consider where he started out. Uh, and when Hubble joined the observatory, he was teamed up with Hugh Masson to get the photographs. October 1923, Hubble and Hugh Masson took a photographic plate of the Great Andromeda Spiral with the 100 inch telescope. It was classified as number 331 in a sequence. And the note, Hubble's notebook originally read, Nova suspected. The next night they took another photograph and said confirm, Nova, Nova suspected. But then they changed their mind because they realized it was actually a CFID and they altered his comments accordingly. And over the next few nights, they repeatedly measured the brightness of this star and they got a plot. They worked out the period. From the period, they could work out the absolute magnitude and they got the distance to the Great Nebula in Andromeda. So by discovering the Cepheid variable, Hubble realized he could determine the distance of the spiral, the most famous one at the moment, and the distance came out by his calculations at 300,000 parsecs, about a million light years. It's actually a bit closer than that now. But by discovering that, it was the key to determine not just the distance of the Andromeda, but to other spirals, other, other galaxies in the universe. He wrote a letter to Shapley in, on the 19th of February, 1924, uh, a bit gloaty, he says, you will be interested to hear that I have found a CFID variable in the Andromeda Nebula. I have followed this nebula this season as closely as the weather permitted, and in the last five months have netted nine novae and two variables. He's warning Shapley that he's actually discovered the true distance of the Andromeda. He actually doesn't officially announce his discoveries until New Year's Day 1925 at a meeting of the American Astronomical Society. And this leads, <coughs> excuse me, uh, leads eventually to, by the end of the 20s, that all, virtually all the astronomers agree that the spirals are outside our own galaxy. And are called island universes. Of course you have to announce your discoveries in the most prestigious places. So if we look at the Yorkshire Evening Post for Thursday January the 21st 1926 we have Dr Edwin Hubble in a study published by the Chicago University in the Astrophysical Journal submits photographs and measurements of another universe and um, it goes on to say that it's the new universe is 66 million million miles away and but I mean yes we've got to announce in the Yorkshire Evening Post because that is the prime place to measure it. While this is going on he's getting married. Grace Lillian Burke she was quite wealthy uh, she was a widow uh, she, she'd started life in quite a, a wealthy family, married uh, a mining engineer who, who got a bit of brass himself. Uh, 
and her first husband had died in 1921 but she was used to the good life and uh, you know she, she, she enjoyed spending the money they had a three-month honeymoon they went toward Europe uh, and all this time he's doing Humerson's back in uh, California taking photographs uh, and she was a socialite she learns or t introduces Edwin to the social life and over the next many years lots of celebrities come and visit at their house uh, people like Charlie Chaplin, Frank Capra, William Hurst, uh, Franklin Roosevelt they also look after Albert Einstein when he's in California he becomes very friendly with Roosevelt they also become friendly with uh, Aldous Huxley the playwright the author that's their house they had the house specially built by an Italian architect uh, that's what it looked like when the Hubbles were living there again we can go on Google and 340 Woodstock Road San Marino there's the Hubble house today uh, still in action one of the things Hubble is known for is redshift looking at the expanding universe well he actually wasn't the first to notice it uh, this chap Slifer had actually noticed uh, redshift. He, he looked at the uh, proper motion of galaxies and, and nebula for a while in, in the early parts of uh, the 19th century. And in 1914, he presented the results on 15 galaxies. And out of the 15 he observed, 11 were shown to be redshifted. Uh, other scientists, Carl Wurtz in 1922 and Lundmark in 1925 had written papers suspecting there existed a relationship between galactic redshifts and distance. Slifer is known actually also, uh, he worked at the Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff and he was the guy who hired Cloud Tombaugh to do the work which led to the discovery of Pluto. But from 1925, Hubble and Humanson were aimed at extending these measurements of galactic distances. And they discovered they were probably the first to actually write a paper that there was a linear relationship between the distance of a galaxy and the value of its redshift velocity. There is some argument that a uh, that uh, a chap called George Lemaitre from France had actually come up with this law before Hubble but he had failed to publish it was Hubble who beat him to the the post as it were and Hubble and Humerson quantified it in mathematical form uh, Humerson actually got his name on the paper so it was a joint paper between Hubble and Humerson so technically what's now called Hubble's constant should actually be called the hubble Humerson constant. That's the plot of their data from 1929. A bit scattered, but it, it does show the possibility of a linear relationship. The fact that it was discovered by Hubble was actually propagated by Milton Humerson as particularly in a 1931 paper on the apparent velocity shifts in the spectra of faint nebula and it was Humerson who went on to actually do a lot of the redshift work that confirmed this uh, law. Uh, Hubble moved on to other things particularly became more of a, uh, a public speaker and uh, putting his theories and the ideas of science out into the public. For example, in 1930, this is a typical article, The Structure of the Universe by Dr. Edwin Hubble. This is in a magazine called The Sphere magazine, which was a bit like uh, the British uh, Strand magazine. Uh, 
One interesting thing here, it says uh, the picture is the Nebula in Orion team at Lick Observatory. Well, that, that, that is the Sombrero Galaxy uh, M104. It's not the, the uh, Orion Nebula. But uh, he's starting to become the Brian Cox of America in the 1930s. He, he's becoming a, a popular scientist. Humerson is actually continuing the work through 1936. Hubble is working on uh, classification. He, he's trying to um, smooth out uh, Max Wolf's work, that, that early map of the differences between galaxies. And he comes up with the tuning fork uh, method, which we actually still use today. Uh, Edwin Hubble's uh, system from ellipticals to, to spirals and barred spirals, which we use today. Um, one of the interesting things is that uh, Hubble believed that uh, the universe wasn't expanding, that the red shift was a unknown or unrecognized principle of nature. Uh, and to the very end, he maintained this position that the, the expanding universe, the Big Bang, was, was not a thing. Uh, I, think, I think Einstein also had a, a little problem with the, the idea of a, a singularity at the start of uh, the universe. During his time, Hubble discovered his one and only asteroid, uh, number 1373, called Cincinnati. Uh, but more and more, Hubble was becoming a celebrity astronomer. His wife, Grace, was basically helping him edit uh, his articles, was becoming a manager of his speaking uh, opportunities, lecture circuits, uh, and he was on the radio. He gave, he gave regular talks on the radio on science. Pearl Harbor happened and Hubble was taken into the army. It's uh, from 1942 he served as chief of ballistics and director of the supersonic wind tunnels laboratory in Maryland. Those are pictures I've managed to pinch off the internet that purport to be that facility. Uh, what the date is, I don't know. There may be a later date. I, I suspect this one here that's got Alarmy on it uh, is probably 1950s, uh, but who knows. He led the development of a high speed camera, which enables you to look at the trajectory of, uh, of shells, high speed shells coming out of uh, the muzzles of uh, large guns. And uh, is credited with improving the design and performance of bombs and rockets. At the end of the war, he was awarded the Medal of Merit for his wartime work. After the war, he, he again rejoined basically the social circuit. He, he lectured. He had some undergraduate students and graduate students that he, he looked after. Uh, but uh, he, he got involved slightly in politics of science. He, uh, he lobbied for the construction of the 200 inch telescope at Palomar. Uh, and as a result, his, his face there appeared on the front of Time magazine in 1948. And he got these prizes, the Newcomb Cleveland Prize, Bernard Medal, Bruce Medal. Uh, he was elected to the French Academy of Science. He got the gold medal of the Royal Astronomical Society. No Nobel Prize. He was actually nominated in 1953, but he was never going to receive it for an obvious reason. Well, the last thing he did before uh, he passed uh, was he, he published a paper with uh, one of his graduate students, Alan Sandage, uh, on what's now called Hubble Sandage objects, which are very massive stars, a luminosity of up to a million times that of the sun, long period variables, masses several hundred times that of the sun, uh, very short lived. Uh, sometimes um, they're mistaken for novae because the, the, the changes in brightness are, 
are so great. And Alan Sandage uh, continued Hubble's work on variable stars for, for his lifetime. Hubble died 1953, 28th of September, of a stroke. And if he hadn't died, he would have probably won the Nobel Prize in 1953. Very, very strangely, his wife never held a, a public funeral for him and never revealed what happened to his body. Was he buried? Was he cremated? Was he left in a bin bag? Nobody knows. Uh, so the memorial is in the city of Marshfield, uh, outside the courthouse. It's uh, in memory of astronomer Edwin Powell Hubble, uh, discover external galaxies in the expanding universe. Uh, this was erected in 1999 and they actually put up a statue to him, but the statue is actually a replica of the uh, of the telescope. He's also remembered and remembered in stamps, so these are a, a variety of stamps from around the world um, with his face on it. Uh, so mainly uh, African countries uh, that have been able to find this one American stamp that's got his face on it celebrating uh, the fact that he's uh, I think a lot of it was during the launch of the Hubble spacecraft. Surprisingly, he never got a Google Doodle, but George Lemaitre, who actually proposed the Hubble law and the linear redshift, he actually got a Google Doodle, and that, that was it on uh, the 17th of July, 2018. Because Lemaitre actually was the one who came up with the idea of a big bang or the cosmic egg, as he called it. So thanks for listening. Uh, that's it from me. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for that, Roy. Uh, just going back to George Lemaitre. Yeah. Uh, he did his work uh, using Einstein's publications. Mm. He, uh, when he approached Einstein um, in the 1920s about it and uh, proposed the fact that uh, there's this idea of the Big Bang expanding universe and it came from his equations, Einstein got quite cross with him. Yeah. He basically sent him away with a flea in his ear. So, um, yeah, very interesting uh, character of the better. Okay. Uh, so, if anybody's got any questions, as usual, if you can just put your hand up and uh, to nominate yourself, and I will uh, turn your mic on. Anybody got a question? Nobody. I'm getting off lightly. I was just about to say, oh, hold on. John, John Leach. Let me see if I can... Can you, can you hear me? Yeah. Good evening, John. Good evening. Um, it, fascinating as ever, Roy. Um, without going into too much detail, you mentioned this thing called red and blue shifted. What, yeah. what, what, that, what's that in relation to? What, what, what does it mean? Simply. Basically, it's, it's Doppler shifts. So uh, in sound, if you're stood on the side of the road and a police car's coming towards you, right it's high pitched and as it passes you the pitch changes to low pitches so the galaxies if they're coming towards you the blue shifted so we know the andromeda galaxy is actually coming towards us so when we do look at the where the hydrogen alpha line is in the spectrum it moves to the blue end of the spectrum but most of the galaxies the further away the more red shifted so the spectral lines of the the elements in that spectra move correspondingly more to the red the further they are away so basically uh, we've now got another measurement of how distant something is by looking how red shifted it is because some of these really distant objects we can't identify individual stars or variables in there so it's, it's a method we've now got of measuring how far things are away uh, but looking at uh, galaxies up to about 
50 million light years away. <coughs> we could actually, nowadays, on the big telescopes, identify some of these variables. So it enabled us to, to draw these lines. And, and the slope of the line was important. Uh, when Hubble first measured it, I think they came up with a figure of 250 miles per second by, per megaparsec. That figure's now come down to somewhere around about 70. Uh, so uh, it, it's an important measurement because it's detailing actually how fast the universe is expanding and gets us back to the big date of the Big Bang. If you know what I mean. Okay. Thanks very much. Yeah, thanks very much indeed for that, Roy. Okay. No. Gary, have you got a question? No, no, no. Oh, okay. Has anybody else got a question or uh, an observation? I've got an observation, Roy. Okay. So, uh, in Bill Bryson's book, uh, A Short History of Nearly Everything, he, he does a little chapter on Hubble, uh, and he's quite disrespectful to Hubble. Because Hubble was uh, prone to exaggerate his uh, his war duties and things that happened to him, so mm. maybe embellish the stories for his social gatherings. Yeah, I think I think that came a lot of that came from his wife Grace. From, right. From what I've read, she liked the social life. She she liked the celebrities and what have you at the house. Uh, Douglas Fairbanks, Charlie Chaplin, uh, you know, uh, is it Corder, the director? There's a big list of the people who used to come and dine at the Hubble's household. Uh, so she she was thrusting, in a sense, Hubble into the, the higher ranks of social life in, in Los Angeles. You know, the Hollywood set, if you like. So... But that's probably where that came from. And I think Hubble enjoyed it. Okay. Has anybody got a, any other points or questions? All right then. So can we, in our usual manner, show our appreciation to Roy and just say, <laughs> thank you very much, Roy. No problem. <laughs>